My name is Brian Engelken, and today I want to talk about taming chaos in neural circuits. I'm postdoc at the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia University, and part of the work was done during my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization. I guess we all agree that information in the brain is processed by the coordinated activity of large-scale neural circuits. Understanding mechanisms for this complex dynamics gives rise to functions such as processing sensory information, performing decisions, or controlling behavior as a challenge, both for experimentalists and for theoreticians. In theory, very often we model neural activity in recurrent neural networks, and it's an important question how the spontaneously generated activity interplays with external input, time varying input. In the extreme case, external input can control the recurrent network state. And today I want to ask, uh, under which conditions does external input control the recurrent network state? Mathematically speaking, you can ask, what is the probability of a recurrent network state X given some time varying external input? That's the classical encoding problem. And that's pro uh, relevant for three reasons. Firstly, you can think of your brain as a network of networks and understanding under which conditions one circuit can control the activity in another circuit and um, is important to understand when it can transmit information. Secondly, there are novel tools for experimentalists, optogenetic perturbation tools that allow to modulate the activity of populations of neurons or even of single neurons with time resolved um, resolution. And for such experiments, it's crucial to understand what is the most subtle time varying external input that can fully control a recurrent network state. And what kind of perturbations do we expect to have an effect on behavior? Which ones do we expect to vanish quickly? So for such experiments, we need um, also uh, theoretical tools. And lastly, um, it is important to understand when external input can control recurrent circuit activity because if you want to perform a reliable function for a given input to generate a certain output of the network, um, for example, if you learn uh, such a reliable input output functions, it is important to understand under which conditions those can exist. Today, I want to ask uh, the following scientific questions. How weak can external input be and still control target circuit activity? What are mathematical criteria for achieving control of nonlinear target circuit activity? And how does input correlations, uh, how do input correlations affect the controllability? I want to ask these questions in three different parts. First, I will talk about input-driven spiking balance networks. Then I will talk about classical firing rate networks. And at the end, I will talk about input-driven balanced uh, firing rate networks. In the first part, I will show you that single cell biophysical properties are a crucial factor in determining whether you can suppress spontaneously generated chaotic activity and also whether you can con fully control the recurrent network state. In the second part, I will show you that uh, in this more mathematically tractable model, we can fully mat mathematically characterize in some limits the uh, phase space structure of chaotic activity and how it responds to time varying external input. And then the last part, um, I will show you the role of um, correla correlations in the external input. And I will uh, show you that the best input to drive a network, a rate network in the balanced state is actually when activity across neurons is independent and not shared across different neurons. So to setting the stage before I dive into the results, I want to briefly review a couple of uh, classical concepts in dynamical systems um, that will be used in the following of the talk. If you see neural circuits as a dynamical system, that's usually done on two levels. On the level of spike networks, individual neurons are described by membrane potentials, and they interact with pulse interactions. On a more abstract level, neurons are described by firing rates, and they smooth, smoothly interact in time. 
in both of these cases, the single unit dynamics is very simple. In the case of a spiking network, you can think of it as an oscillator. In the case of a rate network, you can think of it as a uh, relaxator. And only through the recurrent interactions of many of these simple units, um, complex dynamics and functions arises, and also only through the uh, recurrent interactions, chaos, collective chaos emerges. So both of these types of dynamical systems can, uh, on a wide range of parameters, exhibit chaos. And I will now ask how this can be shaped by time varying external input. In dynamical systems, we distinguish two qualitatively different uh, types of dynamics. If infinitesimal perturbations of initial conditions decay over time, we call a system stable. If, if a system is chaotic, however, infinitesimal perturbations grow exponentially, and you have a positive Lyapunov exponent. The Lyapunov exponents are the asymptotic rates of exponential divergence of nearby trajectories. So for some initial state, HU, you can um, evolve a perturbation U0 over time, which become UT, and the perturbation size is U epsilon. And then this um, asymptotic limit gives you the exponential growth rate. But in a dynamical system, there's not only one Lyapunov exponent, but in an n-dimensional system, there are n Lyapunov exponents. And they're given by the logarithms of the eigenvalues of this oscillatic matrix. So the oscillatic matrix, as you can see, is a symmetric matrix, and it's built up of the inner product of these long-term Jacobians. The long-term Jacobians is a product of the individual Jacobians. So at each moment in time, you can ask, how does a perturbation in n different uh, independent directions affect the network state in the next state? And so um, that gives you the Jacobi, uh, Jacobian matrix. And now the product of Jacobians characterizes how a small infinitesimal volume element is evolving along the trajectory and how different directions grow and shrink. And from the um, inner product of this long term Jacobian, we get the uh, Lyapunov spectrum. And you can think of the Lyapunov spectrum as a characterization of growth rates in the tangent space along a, a trajectory. So whenever a system is chaotic, there's automatically an, an dynamic entropy rate associated with it because two nearby states, which are indistinguishable by finite precision readout, they are being pulled apart by the chaotic dynamics and become distinguishable over time. And that, uh, so you learn about the microscopic initial state. If you don't care about the microscopic initial state in the neuroscience setting, you might think of this entropy as a contribution to noise entropy. So that characterizes how fast microscopic noise overrides your uh, macroscopic network state. If you care about the, the microscopic information, that can give you an estimate of the rate by which this uh, microscopic um, information becomes accessible to a microscopic readout. Now, as you all know, um, measuring information and entropies in high dimensional systems is generally intractable because of the curse of dimensionality. To do it, you would need to evaluate high dimensional probability distributions, and that requires an exponential amount of data or computational time. However, under weak mathematical constraints, if the dynamical system is endowed with smooth densities along the unstable yeah. manifolds, this coming uh, of unary rate is given by the sum of the positive Lyapunov exponents. So the sum of the positive Lyapunov exponents, you can think of it that all unstable directions contribute to this dynamic entropy rate. And so they, um, along all these unstable directions, small perturbations grow. Today, I want to talk about input-driven dynamical systems. And for that, the notion of random dynamical systems is very useful. Here, uh, you consider uh, a set of different initial conditions. You can see here in different shades of gray. And you ask, how do they evolve if they are exposed to a shared time-bearing external input. You can think of it as a stimulus in a neuroscience setting. So that's very different from a Fokker-Planck approach where you would consider a fixed input release, uh, a, a fixed initial condition and a set of different uh, noise realization. In such a setting, there are a couple of mathematical uh, theorems that can be useful. So 
for white noise input, it's guaranteed that if the largest Lyapunov exponent is negative, so if microscopic perturbations decay exponentially, then also globally, there's a convergence to a random sink guaranteed. So all initial uh, conditions will collapse over time onto a set of measure zero, or will collapse onto, yeah, onto uh, a set of measure zero. And um, if the largest Lyapunov is positive, however, there exists no control. In this case, um, different initial conditions or different distributions of initial conditions will um, converge onto um, a time-dependent chaotic attractor. So here you see a visualization on the left-hand side with weak external input uh, projected on the first three principal components in that work of, I think, 50 rate units. And you can see that with weak input, the network is still chaotic, so different initial conditions don't collapse into a random sink. On the right-hand side, let me play it once more, and all these different initial conditions collapse over time onto a set of measure zero. So that's what I would uh, call um, control today. To summarize, the sign of the largest Lyapunov exponents tell us whether the system is uh, stable or not. The sum of the positive Lyapunov exponents give us under weak mathematical constraints the entropy rate, the attractor dimensionality, so this fractal set in which the chaotic uh, attractor lives, that can be estimated by also by the Lyapunov exponents and can be estimated by the number of Lyapunov exponents whose uh, sum interpolates to zero. You can think of D as the highest dimensional hypersphere whose volume does not shrink by the overall dissipative system dynamics, but the growing directions are compensated by the shrinking directions. So overall, the vol uh, D-dimensional volume element in the tangent space would uh, preserve its volume. And this interpolation um, is basically to account for non-integer dimensions. So here, just as a depiction, the phase space of a toy model, um, a toy network of four um, quadratic integrated phi neurons, I've uh, color coded the um, stable and unstable manifolds by their local, respective local Lyapunov exponents. And that really maps out the phase space structure. Uh, at least in, in a low dimensional system, you can even visually see um, the stable and uh, unstable manifolds here. Um, so uh, today I want to use these tools from um, ergodic uh, theory of dynamical systems to ask the questions um, in, in these uh, three settings. And let me now start with diving into this uh, results of the spiking networks. So here I want to show you how biophysical features of individual neurons uh, control or govern the controllability of um, how well input spike trains can uh, control or suppress chaos. Um, so we consider a single population of recurrently interacted spiking neurons. Um, the coupling strength is chosen to scale, chosen to scale with one over square root k, where k is the number of synapses per neuron. And um, with external input, with uh, this setup, um, large excitatory inputs are dynamically canceled by net recurrent inhibition and the network settles into asynchronous irregular activity and the variance neither vanishes or diverges in the limit of large K. So that's a very robust way of generating asynchronous irregular activity. And uh, you're all familiar to that, or many of you are familiar to that from the uh, work on balanced networks. So chaos and balanced networks with constant input was studied before. And uh, Guillaume Lajoie pioneered the study of balanced networks driven by white noise. And as you might expect from random dynamical systems theory, he found that if the largest Lyapunov exponent is negative, different initial conditions collapse onto a random sink. We found that if you drive a network with streams of input spike trains, so with pulses, that it behaves mathematically very different. And um, so I will now describe the setup of the network. We, um, we have three um, knobs which we can turn. The external input um, rate of Poisson inputs we keep fixed, and also the recurrent um, 
firing rate we will keep fixed to have a fair comparison. And um, the thing which we will change is the input synapses, so J0 external, and a single cell parameter of the recurrent network. It's uh, widely known that um, spiking neurons vary drastically in their information transmission rate. We have to choose a single neuron and we uh, decided one, to, we, we designed one where we can change the information transmission rate in a feed forward scenario. For that, um, we choose a neuron where the slope and the unstable fixed point is changeable. And I will call this parameter the rapidness in the following. That is achieved by smoothly gluing together two parabolas, keeping the slope and the stable fixed point uh, fixed, and yeah, and, and yeah, the, making the slope and the unstable fixed point changeable. Now, for low rapidness, neurons launch only gradually into spike. This would be the classical quadratic integrated fine neuron with uh, a rapidness of one. With high uh, or with, with high rapidness or very sharp spike onset, neurons spike almost instantaneously once they are beyond the unstable fixed point. So that allows neurons to position their spikes very precisely in time and thus transmit high frequency information or generally um, more information about time varying external input. So we put these neurons into a recurrent network. And because of their simple design, we can solve them analytically between network spikes. And that is done, that allows efficient event-based simulation. Now we'll just briefly describe how that's done. So we build an exact firing rate, firing map, which maps the entire network state from one network spike to the next. The derivative of this map gives you the Jacobian base on which the Lyapunov exponents are calculated. That's, that can be all done with uh, machine precision. Now, conventionally, um, if you would do such event-based simulation, that has a time, would have a time complexity of order n, because you have to, evaluate, to iterate to all neurons to find the next spike in neuron, push forward um, all neurons to the next spike time, update the post synaptic neurons, and reset the spike neuron. This is all operations. Uh, the first two are operations of order n. And if you measure the CPU time as a function of network size, that grows therefore linearly and makes large network simulation prohibitively expensive. Now, during my PhD, I developed another algorithm which can reduce this time complexity to order log n. If you have a fixed number of synapses per neuron and if you calculate a fixed number of Lyapunov exponents. That's achieved by two uh, tricks. Firstly, we go into a co-moving reference frame where we don't have to um, update each and every neuron at each spike time. And secondly, we um, use an efficient data structure called a binary heap to look up the next spike time. And then only percolating into this binary heap, which is an operation of order log n, needs to be done at, at every spike time. And so in summary, that allows us now to uh, do very um, exact, efficient network simulations of very large networks. Just to give you an idea, um, simulating 100 seconds of a network of uh, a million neurons would take more than three years with the conventional algorithm to approximately a PhD lifetime, while with this novel algorithm, it's less than one hour. So how does input spike trains affect chaos? We find input spike trains suppress network chaos. Here you see the largest Lyapunov exponent as a function of this input coupling strength, J0 external. And for very strong external input, the largest Lyapunov exponent is pushed down to zero. So that means chaos is suppressed. Now note that this external input has to be an order of 10 times as strong as the recurrent couplings. However, we find that if we increase the action potential onset rapidness, uh, this is drastically facilitated. So you need way weaker input synapses in order to fully control, uh, fully suppress network chaos in the recurrent target network. So how does the network activity change from um, weak input to strong input? Activity is always asynchronous irregular. So from just looking at the spike raster, you wouldn't be able to tell how chaotic it is. However, if you look into a single neuron over multiple um, different initial conditions, which are suspect to the same external input drive, you can see that as we crank up the external input, 
the network becomes more and more reliable over, tri uh, over trials. And in fact, for very strong input, there's a transition to complete network state control. To our great surprise, this transition to complete network state control is different from the transition where chaos is being uh, suppressed. And that's what I want to show you next. So for a given rapidness, here is the coupling strength where the, the input coupling strength by the largest Lyapunov exponent becomes zero. So for, where infinitesimal perturbations decay, but only for much stronger input, there's a transition to complete network state control. In between the two, there is multi-stability. That means that small perturbations go back to the same basin of attraction, but sufficiently strong perturbations go into a completely different spike sequence. And um, to understand that concept, uh, this phenomenon better, we used the concept of flux tubes, um, which were first uh, described in pulse coupled networks of inhibitory leak and reality fine neurons. And there, um, small perturbations stay in the same flux tube while sufficiently large perturbations, actually already a single uh, perturbation, which is as small as a single spike, will lead to a completely different spike pattern. So that was done with constant external input. And we use here this concept of the diameter of these flux tubes uh, called the flux tube radius to characterize the phase space. And we found that just above the transition where chaos is suppressed, the flux tube radius is very, very small. And as we now increase the external input strength, flux tube radius is growing. And at uh, some point, um, and there are fewer and fewer flux tubes. And at some point for very strong input, the flux tube radius is actually diverging. So that means there's a transition to complete network state control. And there's a single globally stable trajectory. So that means um, external input is a way of making these flux tubes larger and potentially uh, useful. And that's also true for different values of uh, rapidness. So let me summarize the first part. Um, there's a suppression of chaos by streams of input spike trains that's facilitated by a sharp spike onset that might suggest that biological neurons may be tailored to, for network controllability. We found a transition to complete network state control for very strong input, which is different from the suppression of chaos. In between the two, there's uh, a regime of multi-stability. Something I didn't show you today is that in a um, limit of uh, very high firing rates and weak input couplings, um, so in a diffusion approximation, it's the input variance which governs the suppression of chaos in spike networks. So let me now uh, switch to firing rate networks, which are mathematically more tractable. So one thing which would be really desirable is to understand analytically what shapes entropy, what shapes attractive dimensionality, and what um, shapes the Lipunov exponent, and how do they respond to time varying external input. And in firing rate networks, yeah, if they are more tractable, we were able to give answers to some of these questions and completely characterize the um, chaotic yeah, state phase space structure of these uh, rate networks in, in some minutes. Mm. I will use a canonical model, firing rate networks, which is widely being used in both in, in computational neuroscience community and also in machine learning. Here, um, the change of rate of a single unit is given by a leak term and by a recurrent interaction term. By JIJ is a um, Gaussian matrix with mean zero and variance g squared over n, where you can think of g as a global synaptic strength parameter, and phi is a sigmoidal input output function, for example, a uh, hyperbolic tangent. Such networks um, have been found to provide a very useful substrate for learning input output functions. And while there exists a mean field theory that characterizes autocorrelation and the largest Lyapunov exponent, uh, the collective chaos is not well understood. So here we calculate the, the full Lyapunov spectrum, entropy rates, attractive dimensionality, and ask how do they um, behave with, under uh, uh, external input. We found that, ex as expected from uh, this classical work by Sumpolinski uh, Santi Zammer, that strong coupling intensifies chaos. So the largest Lyapunov exponent first grows linearly up to a critical coupling strength where the global trivial fixed point becomes unstable and collective chaos emerges. Now, looking at the entire Lyapunov spectrum, we can see that uh, 
at the critical coupling strength, the largest Lyapunov exponents hit zero, and then we have a finite fraction of positive Lyapunov exponents. One curious thing you can already see here is that the entire Lyapunov spectrum is point symmetric around the negative inverse characteristic time scale. Now, point symmetry of Lyapunov spectra uh, is known, for example, from Hamiltonian systems, which directly comes from the symplectic phase space structure. But here we talk about a dissipative system. So that was something which is not, uh, not obvious. So I think it's worth spending uh, a few moments describing where that comes from. The symmetry of the Lyapunov spectrum can be understood when we do a change of variables into a co contracting reference frame. So we say z equals e to the power of p divided by tau h. Plugging that into the original equation of motion, we can get rid of the leak term. And now we have an equation which actually stays identical if we flip the direction of time. So if we say z of t equals z tilde of minus t, we arrive at exactly the same expression, only we pick up one minus from the time derivative. We can put this minus in front of the coupling matrix. Let me remind you that the weights are drawn uh, from a distribution with mean zero. So that now means that statistically speaking, um, the forward in, in this contracting reference frame, um, the system is time reversible. And now in, for each, if it's time reversible, that means that for each, um, growing directions in forward um, phase space, there's a um, analogous, statistically speaking, um, analogous growing directions in the backward direction. And also for each shrinking directions in the tangent space forward, there's an analogous shrinking direction uh, backward. So there's a symmetry in the oscillating matrix. Taking the, so the news are here, the eigenvalues of the oscillating matrix, and you have this inverse relationship. And taking the logarithm of this gives us the Lyapunov exponent, and you can see that um, assuming that in the backward direction there is an, a similar directory, we arrive at an approximate uh, symmetry of the Lyapunov spectrum. Uh, let me um, stress that that's only an approximate symmetry. It only becomes true in the large network limit. And there's not an exact pairing of Lyapunov exponents. So for example, um, you always have a trivial Lyapunov exponent at zero, which corresponds to a perturbation in the direction of time, and that uh, doesn't exist in the backward direction. One um, fundamental question is, how many latent degrees of freedom do these chaotic systems have? It was conjectured already in this original publi publication in 88 that the number of degrees of freedom is extensive in the network dynamics, so that means it grows linearly with network size, but that's not at all a trivial um, conjecture because there are there coupled, uh, globally coupled systems, for example, globally coupled Kuramoto um, oscillators, where that's not the case. We find here direct numerical evidence that um, these um, networks are ex uh, actually extensive. And you can see that here on the right-hand side, where I depicted the Lyapunov exponent normalized by network size. And if you plot the Lyapunov spectrum for different network size, on top of each other, you say that they are invariant with right with respect to the shape is invariant with respect to network size. This truly results in a linear growth of entropy rates and of dimensionality. And that's uh, direct numerical evidence that these systems are extensive. So how do these chaotic rate networks uh, respond to time varying external input? And to study that question, we um, just added Gaussian white noise to each individual unit. And we find that uh, there's a reduced entropy rate and a reduced dimensionality by time dependent input. It was, um, so we drive each unit with Gaussian white noise of strength sigma. And it was found earlier in discrete time networks and networks with sinusoidal input, and networks with unchained Uhlenbeck process that time dependent, independent, uh, time dependent input, which is independent across neurons, can suppress neuron, can suppress chaos in these types of firing rate networks. Here we find that they also reduce time dependent input also reduces entropy rates and dimensionalities. Here you see the entropy rate as a function of this global coupling strength. And as we crank up the external input strength, you can see that entropy rate decreases. And for very strong input, network is at a random sync. So that now means that over time you don't learn 
any information about the microscopic network state because two nearby directories are not pulled apart anymore. Similarly, also the attracted ender originality uh, goes down as you drive it stronger. So that might be um, surprising to you. You might think, well, if you drive a system with external Gaussian white noise input, shouldn't the um, dimensionality increase? And the opposite is the case, because what we consider here is the conditional dimensionality. So it's a dimensionality um, for a given external input. And as you have seen in the video before, different initial conditions with very strong input collapse into a um, set of measure zero into a random sink. So as a conclusion, time bearing input reduces entropy and dimensionality of the dynamics. Generally, it's uh, difficult to calculate analytically the Lipunov spectrum, but in some limits, we can give you, uh, we, we were able to calculate uh, analytical approximations. Just to remind you, the Lipunov spectrum is given by the logarithms of the eigenvalue of the oscillatic matrix that is uh, built up of these long term Jacobians, which are generally a product of non commuting matrices. We found that in some limits, the Lipunov spectrum is invariant and are shuffling the sequence of these Jacobians. And um, in these limits, we can give random matrix approximations. This is the case if G is large, because then the autocorrelations um, between Jacobians become short. Also, that's true for very strong input drive. And there are two other limits um, where we can analytically approximate them. That is, if G goes to the crypt, critical coupling strength, in this case, the autocorrelation between Jacobians diverges, but the Jacobians are almost identical and also for discrete time dynamics, then subsequent Jacobians become uncorrelated in the large network limit that was already pointed out earlier. And so here you see in these different limits, the analytical approximation here um, with full lines, um, you see the numerical uh, results and they lie very well, they agree very well. Another limit where we can analytically fully calculate the Lipunov spectrum and even give explicit expressions is for a piecewise linear network. Um, um, again, the points are the uh, numerical simulations and they agree well with uh, the theory. And uh, one thing what you can see here is that as we increase the global coupling strength, the largest Lipunov exponent keeps on, and uh, keeps on growing while both entropy and dimensionality peak and um, in this analytical setup, we can actually understand the reason for that. Here, um, what happens is if you, as you increase G, the variance in the network is getting larger and therefore a larger fraction of units are in saturation. And effectively, therefore, fewer, network, uh, fewer neurons take part in the chaotic dynamics. And therefore, you have fewer unstable directions and, few, and, and overall um, yeah, and a decreasing entropy and a decreasing dimensionality. However, the fastest diverging direction, which is characterized by the largest Lipunov exponent, that still keeps on gradually growing. So um, having the full Lipunov spectrum here really gives us new uh, insights. A last remark for that part, that we found a direct mathematical link between Lipunov spectra and the error gradients during backpropagation. So if you do a backpropagation through time, you evaluate the gradient of some total loss that's done by unrolling the network dynamics in time. So if you have some loss derived by some, uh, let's say, recurrent weight W, you'd have to take uh, the um, chain rule over and over again. And that means you have to iterate through the recurrent network state over and over again. And what pops up here during this iterative pr uh, process is a long-term Jacobian, which is exactly the same as the long-term Jacobian we used to uh, calculate the Lipunov spectrum. So there's a direct link between um, linear stability along a trajectory in the forward pathway and um, the gradient uh, dynamic or uh, gradient properties during backpropagation through time. I hope in the uh, theoretical neuroscience lecture, I'm allowed to mention that, but I guess some people believe that the brain is also doing something like uh, error minimization. And so trivially, we can say that if the large Lipunov exponent is positive, then we want to um, um, push um, information very far back into the future using backprop 
largely run into um, exploding gradients, and conversely, the negatively largest Lee Pinoff exponent, we go into uh, vanishing gradients. But we can say even more. So we can really make statements about how many independent channels are there which we can send information across during vaporization through time. And uh, I think uh, we can learn a lot about the, yeah, the concepts from dynamical systems here for, for machine learning or for, for task optimized neural networks. And the visualization here comes from Javit Lind. Uh, so um, I guess um, I'll jump over this part. You can also calculate the Pruno spectra of LSTM networks and find the uh, accumulation of slow Lyapunov exponent of Lyapunov exponents close to zero if we saturate the forget gate. Um, but uh, let me summarize so, because I'm very uh, excited to share with you the last part. To summarize the second part, I showed you that for input driven rate networks, we can calculate the complete Lyapunov spectrum generally um, of continuous time random networks. I found that uh, dimensionality and entropy are reduced by fluctuating inputs. Uh, there's a symmetry of the leap spectrum around um, the ne negative inverse characteristic time scale. And entropy and dimensionality peak for strong coupling and random matrix approximations uh, allow us to, calc uh, to characterize the complete leap spectrum. Um, and we pointed out this link between Lyapunov spectra and gradients of perforation through time. If you want to learn more, there's a preprint on archive in this work. So in the last part, I want to go to input-driven networks that are in a balanced state. And um, I want to show the role of input correlations of these, um, uh, on these balanced networks. We found that there is a huge difference between driving these um, balanced network with independent or with correlated input, you might ex expect that driving all neurons with the same external input um, synchronizes the network and is the most effective way of controlling the network state. We found that exactly the opposite is actually true. It's much more difficult to suppress chaos with common external input. And to really mathematically describe that case, uh, we had to go beyond previous dynamic mean field approaches and we had to develop a um, dynamic mean field theory that takes into account time varying means, time varying variances, and autocorrelations that explicitly depend on two time points. And for that case, we also calculated uh, uh, with mean field theory the Lyapunov exponent. Um, so the setup here is similar to before. We have a recurrent rate network, only now we have large excitatory external input and uh, of order square root n. In a recurrent coupling, which is scaled with uh, minus j, whose mean is, cup, uh, is scaled with um, minus j0 divided by square root n. So that leads to very large excitatory currents that are dynamically canceled by recurrent inhibition. And that is reminiscent of balanced networks that were previously introduced in binary uh, neurons by Frieswag and Simpolinsky. We constrain the firing rates to be positive. Do we use a threshold linear nonlinearity? And such a setup of a balanced firing rate network was uh, characterized previously with, in an autonomous system, so without any external time varying input. We um, considered time varying external input. We found we we used two different types of external input. We used either common input, which is identical across neurons, or independent input that is independent across neurons. And we found that there's a huge difference between the two. So uh, as an example here, I show for common input, um, uh, each neuron receives a sine wave of amplitude I1, where uh, F is the frequency. And for independent input, I drive the network with um, also with sine waves across neurons, but now they have all a random shift. So the second case is similar to what uh, Kanaka Rajan and colleagues studied earlier in pan H networks. And so while this one, for this independent case, already a mean field approach existed. For common input, however, you have mean, you have now suddenly uh, a mean of the network that depends on time and also variance that depends on time. You can't assume that the system is stationary anymore. So the autocorrelation also explicitly depends on two time points. And so we had to develop a novel um, non-stationary mean field theory and um, to tackle that, that um, case. 
for common input, if all neurons receive identical input, we see that this external positive input, which now has a time modulation, elicits large recurrent uh, currents that are anti-correlated. And um, so that results in a cancellation of this large external input current and only residuals remain. And so activity is still um, asynchronous. In contrast, for independent input, um, the external input is independent across neurons. And so that means that there are the recurrent currents can only track the global mean, but they cannot track any time-dependent component of the external input. And therefore, no such cancellation occurs. And here on the bottom, you see that these uh, local fields are now becoming periodic over time. So they are entrained by the external input. And uh, to quantify that, we calculated again the largest leaf of exponent. Um, so let me first briefly describe you in more mathematically of the, the effect of common versus independent input. We can decompose this original equation into uh, a mean and a residual fluctuation part. So M is the mean across the population and H bar tilde is the resi residual fluctuation. If you do that con decomposition for common input, we can directly see that the common input drives the M equation. And in the M equation, there are very large excitatory external inputs um, and uh, very large recurrent currents. Nu is here the uh, firing rate, the population firing rate. In contrast, um, if we uh, use independent external input, this independent external input now affects the variance, uh, the, the equation of H tilde, so for the residual fluctuations. So here you can really see that come an independent input has qualitatively very different um, effects or affects the dynamics very differently. And so for the for these networks, we calculated the largest Lyapunov exponent here, you, and we find that common input, uh, um, yeah, with common input, chaos is much harder to suppress. Here you see the largest Lyapunov exponent as a function of I1. I1 is the amplitude of the sinusoidal input. And um, you can see that the largest Lyapunov exponent decreases both for common and independent input, but um, you need for common input much, much larger external uh, input amplitude in order to uh, push the largest Lyapunov exponent to zero. We call this critical value I1 critical. This is now the um, value where, uh, of the input amplitude where chaos is being suppressed. Um, for, com for independent input, this critical input is much strong, much weaker compared to common input. And um, next I want to describe some limits where you can see really a qualitative difference. So two cases where we saw a qualitative difference between uh, common and independent input is if you look at the scaling with network size of this critical input strength, you can see that the critical input strength, so the critical amplitude where chaos is being suppressed scales with square root n for common input, but it's independent of network size for independent input. Uh, another case where there's really a qualitative difference is, um, is um, comparing the scaling behavior with the global coupling strength G. So as we go close to the critical uh, G, which is for rectified linear networks, square root two, we see that for common input, the critical input strength is still uh, on the order of square root N, while for independent input, it, it goes down to zero. So in these two limits, large network size and uh, close to the critical coupling strength, there's really a huge difference between uh, common and independent input. Um, uh, finally, I want to talk about time-dependent effects. Um, here you see um, in, with dashed lines, the uh, mean field theory and with uh, dots, the simulations in green uh, common input and violet independent input. And you can see for very high frequencies, they actually become independent, uh, become identical. So in the high frequency limit, they have um, identical scaling. And that comes just from the low pass filtering of the individual units. So the single units just filter out very high frequencies. But uh, going to lower frequencies, you see 
this qualitative difference between common and independent input for independent input, which you see reminiscent of the work of Kanaka Rajan in um, networks of 10H units driven with a random phase, that there's a resonance frequency. Now, uh, let me explain where that resonance frequency comes from. As we drive the network with external input, subsequent Jacobians become decorrelated. And so that means um, that the network is less chaotic. So that means um, the network, you need a smaller external input amplitude to suppress chaos. But for our very high frequencies, and this, as I mentioned before, this low pass filtering effect kicks in. And so these um, two together give then rise, give rise to this uh, resonant frequency. For common input, we see that uh, for a wide range of input frequencies, it is actually uh, almost flat. So the, the critical input strength does not depend on the input frequency. And only when the input frequency is on the order of uh, tau, uh, the one over tau, the characteristic time scale of the network, then we can also see a resonant frequency here, but it's now a different mechanism. It's based on the mean. And you can see that um, this resonant frequency is also accurately captured by uh, the time-dependent mean field theory. And how, how deep this dip is depends on how close you are to the critical coupling strength. If you're very close, then this, deep, this dip can also become arbitrarily deep. Um, finally, I want to show you that this is, has uh, this difference in suppression of chaos is also deep implications of uh, trainability of these balanced firing rate networks that is work which was contributed by Alessandro Ingrosso to this project. Um, he found that uh, you need not only much larger input amplitude to suppress chaos, but also to train the network. And um, he found that by training networks on a simple oscillation task using full force and full force, he used full force because there you have a teacher network where uh, chaos is being suppressed by the external input and the synapses are not changed. So that's really fully described. Uh, the scenario is fully described by our um, theory. What you can see in this figure is the largest Lyapunov exponent uh, on the left hand axis as a function of input coupling strength, and on the right hand axis, the loss. And you can see that where the loss in, in a dashed line um, goes to zero, that's approximately where the largest Lyapunov exponent hits zero. And again, we can see that for um, common input, we need much stronger input to suppress chaos and successfully train the networks compared to independent input. You can also see that if you plot the loss as a function of the Lyapunov exponent, here you see that most networks which have a uh, negative Lyapunov exponent have a very small loss, while as the Lyapunov exponent becomes positive, um, most networks fail to train and the loss is increasing. Um, we uh, developed also um, a mean trade theory, both for the independent and for the common input case. And um, I think uh, just in a nutshell, the way that is done is we consider two replica. Um, so networks with identical network structure and identical um, time dependent external input, but with slightly different initial conditions. You can do, do for both of them a um, mean field approach and reduce the recurrent interaction to an effective Gaussian colored noise term. And now um, you have the following situation. You have two replica driven by this external input, which is pushing these replica together. At the same time, you have the recurrent um, network contribution, the colored noise term, which if the network is uh, without input in a chaotic state, would pull these networks apart. And depending on how strong your external input is, now the one or the other will win. And for the stationary case, uh, such a mean field theory was uh, already um, developed by Derrida and Pomo and in a very pedagogical way, also described by Schuker, Goedeke, and Helias. Uh, we um, extended this here to a non-stationary case where we now had to um, keep, keep track of time-bearing means, time-bearing uh, variances, and two-point autocorrelation function. And based on that, then calculate the variational equation and uh, express the distance between the two replica as a function of autocorrelations and cross-correlations, linearize and evaluate how these, uh, these grow exponentially. So that gave us the Lyapunov exponent, and you can see it agrees very well with, with uh, 
large scale network simulations. Um, so to summarize the last part, we found input correlations impede suppression of chaos and balanced firing rate networks. We find that the, inter the critical input is of order log, uh, square root n for correlated input, but is only of order one for independent input. We developed a non-stationary dynamic mean field theory for correlated input that yields time dependent mean variance, two-time autocorrelation functions, and the largest deep of exponent. And we found further that learning is facilitated by uncorrelated network in, in balanced firing rate networks. So taking a step back, for spiking networks, I showed you that the single cell features um, strongly control whether you uh, govern, whether you can control the network or not, and uh, whether you can suppress chaos. Uh, for driven input-driven rate networks, um, we showed you some analytical approximations. And for the input-driven rate networks, I showed you that there was a strong effect on the input correlation. Um, yeah, and uh, with that, uh, as a next step, where we want to take that is we want to make predict, we want to design um, um, predictions for um, time-dependent optogenetic perturbations. Uh, we want to study the reorganization of neural activity manifolds during learning. So, how is the network structure stabilized from before to after learning? And lastly, using this time dependent mean field theory, uh, we want to develop a theory of information flow between neural networks. Um, lastly, I want to thank all the people involved in these projects. This was a true team effort. Uh, I want to particularly uh, acknowledge my postdoc mentor, Larry Abbott, at the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience, all the other people at the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience my uh, PhD mentor, Fred Wolf, uh, people at the Max Planck for uh, dynamics and self-organization, external collaborators and colleagues for many discussions, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.